Thanks, everyone. I wanted to uh, take a moment to introduce Huguette LaBelle, uh, someone who is well known to uh, many, if not all of you, I'm sure. Uh, I'm happy to say we welcome Huguette to be a board member of GFI uh, last year, and right from the outset, she was, uh, it was a very comfortable fit. Uh, not only is she uh, an expert in, in international development uh, due to her time as president of the Canadian International Development Agency, but like Thomas Pogge, uh, who spoke a bit ago, she is a PhD in philosophy. And much like Raymond Baker, she probably flies about a million miles a year. So she fits, fits in quite well. Uh, during her very distinguished uh, career, she's worn many hats. Uh, she's been Chancellor of the University of Ottawa, head of the Canadian Red Cross, and as well as the uh, chair of the Board of Directors of Transparency International, to name just a few. In 2011, she was awarded uh, Canada's highest honor, the Order of Ottawa, which recognizes the highest level of individual excellence and achievement in any field. And I would say from her bio, it could say in excellence in many fields. Uh, please welcome Huguette LaBelle. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you've got a lot of staying power, obviously, but I'm glad you got around to go and get a coffee. Uh, otherwise, you know, people start getting a little bit low after, after a while. Well, I think we need to start with the dedication of the book that is being launched today. And that dedication, uh, Raymond, is uh, to those who suffer the indignity of poverty. And I would add to that the danger of living in conflict areas and with insecurity. So we're really talking here of something very, very important. And I want to congratulate GFI, which of course I'm part of, but uh, for the work that's being done and for the, the very long-standing collaboration between GFI and Transparency International, and would like also to uh, uh, commend the fact that we have some colleagues from TI in the room as well. Um, I don't know how many of you were in Monterey. That's where I started. Uh, which then, of course, moved on to Doha and to Addis. And uh, although Monterey did say a lot of the right things, it was a very different conference. There had not been all the discussions, the hearings that we have seen en route to uh, Addis. But Addis, like Monterey, was not necessarily easy to achieve. Uh, countries uh, were debating both behind the scenes and in front of the scene, because many had different views about what should be uh, in the declaration in Addis. And uh, the responsibilities, uh, um, you know, as well as the collaboration and the advocacy of many organizations uh, was very important, I think, in pushing forward some of those discussions, including civil society organization, the academic group, and some leaders of industry uh, in terms of uh, doing this not only at the global level, but within uh, countries. So this year, we have heard, is of course a very important one. And when you look at the goals uh, that are part of the sustainable development uh, goals, as well as ADIS, we've got a lot of the right stuff there a lot of the things we would like to see. Um, and of course, the problem will be, what do we do after September? And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. But before that, when you, I don't know how many of you have taken the time of reading the Addis Declaration. I'm sure you do that every night before going to bed. Uh, I have read it a number of times. But um, uh, you know, what is rather Interesting there is that, of course, the main goal is to end poverty and hunger and then achieve sustainable development with three dimensions, promoting inclusive economic growth, protecting the environment, and promoting social inclusion. I will leave aside the commitments that have been made broadly 
the cross-cutting areas relating to the SDGs and that were also uh, raised in the Addis Declaration and come to the action areas immediately to deal with the topic at hand today, which is illicit financial flows. What is interesting is that r the first item of the action on Addis it started with domestic public resources. And right immediately, item 23 to 29 dealt with some of the work that we are all concerned about and that we have heard uh, since noon, whether it is redouble efforts to substantially reduce interna illicit financial flows by 2030 with a view to eventually eliminating them, reduce opportunity for tax avoidance, um, ensure transparency in all financial transactions, ensure that all companies, including multinational, pay taxes to the government of countries where economic activity occurs and value is created, encourage information sharing among financial institutions, uh, encourage the international community to develop good practices on asset recovery, uh, strive to eliminate safe havens, uh, strive, I, I underline the word strive here, uh, it's a weak action, uh, strive uh, as well to strengthen regulatory frameworks at all level to further increase transparency and accountability of financial institutions and the corporate sector and governments, strengthen international cooperation, uh, scaling up tax cooperation, transparency, natural resources, access to beneficial ownership information. It's not quite public registers of beneficial owners, but it's at least getting there. Uh, take into account the work of the OECD and G20 on base erosion and profit shifting, strengthen national audit institution, establish transparent public procurement frameworks, and so on. So I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm listing those it's, it's to make the point that a lot of the commitments that have been made uh, in Addis are very much in line with what we are talking today. Uh, what is, why have we got this kind of, um, these kinds of commitments? I would like to believe that a lot of it is because of what has happened since Doha. What has happened in the last let's say since about 2007, 2008, and Raymond, I would probably say with your first book on uh, capitalism's Achilles heel uh, that you published earlier, in, I guess in 2005, um, where illicit financial flows began to be put on the, on the world agenda. But what has happened since, since Monterey and Doha? First of all, Norway played a very interesting role, the government of Norway, in holding a number of conferences about these issues. Um, the establishment of what is now called the uh, Financial Transparency Coalition, which the uh, GFI was very instrumental in, and which brings together a number of organizations, including Transparency International, from different parts. And this is, I think, playing, has played a very important role in keeping uh, the issue on the world agenda and continues uh, to do so. And of course, this was supported also by the government of Norway uh, along, along the way. Um, a, a third point, I think, that of, of what was happening during this was that the OECD started to have a number of conferences on between tax authorities from around the world. Um, and this, and their early work, I would like to believe, uh, was important uh, in getting the G20 to take note. Uh, there were more things that got the G20 to take note, but that, I think, was one of them um, on the whole issue of beneficial ownership and tax exchange and, uh, and tax information. The financial crisis, I think, got uh, Western countries to realize how much money they were losing on tax evasion uh, and also on tax avoidance. And that became, I think, a very important issue uh, around that time. As well as some whistleblowers started to put some information 
uh, on, on the uh, world discussion, as well as some legislation, and I'll come back to that, but the, the discovery of the complicity of a number of banks, large banks, uh, in participating, either by not doing due diligence, by looking the other way, or by being complicit in uh, illicit money from uh, persons uh, from PEPs and others. Now, something else that happened during that period was the U.S. Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, and this was referred to earlier. And I won't go into that because a lot of people in this room are probably very familiar with it, but it has meant that um, it is sort of, in a sense, forcing other countries to cooperate uh, on, uh, um, on you know, other financial institutions in, to, in terms of searching the records for reporting of uh, persons who have assets outside of, of these countries. And I think this is launching a global discussion about reciprocity in this regard. I think another point was the G20 and some of what they have been uh, committing to, uh, including uh, the asking the OECD uh, to launch its base erosion of profit shifting initiative, um, to develop multilateral instrument to facilitate the automatic exchange of information on tax, uh, aim, aiming at curtailing, of course, seepage of revenues from developing countries, but also from Western countries. Something else that happened was what did happen in the, in the EU Parliament. Uh, where in 2013, 2014, legislation was passed uh, requiring countries of the EU to report taxes paid on a country-by-country -country basis where their multinationals were operating, um, as well as approving legislation requiring public registers of beneficial ownership of companies uh, in member countries. The UK started early on that uh, as well. January 19th of this year, the high-level panel on illicit financial flows um, from Africa, chaired by Tebo Mbiki, and Raymond, you were part of that uh, panel. I think the publication of that panel, again, put the whole issue of illicit financial flows uh, on the agenda and reinforced uh, the work that was taking place. Now, um, what is happening as well, and what you will see in the Addis Declaration, is what I'm, what I'm calling, at least to some degree, a new interest in what's happening at the subnational level. We've concentrated a lot on national level, public sector, and otherwise. And a lot of the activity is happening when we're talking of illicit financial flows, not just at the national level, but locally or provincially or statewide. And um, I think that, you know, when you're looking at the greater Tokyo or Shanghai with close to soon will be 50 million people within the next few years, not in a decade from now. These are bigger than many countries put together. And therefore, their activity, the activity at the city level, I think is something that has been taking greater traction uh, in the past while. And also, I would say that because of a number of scandals, because of publications from the World Bank, the IMF, regional banks, OECD, UN, um, the whole area of infrastructure um, is also uh, there. It's been there, but it's certainly not fading away as where so much money is lost, which then becomes part of the illicit flows uh, running around the world. So that, I think, remains a very uh, important uh, aspect. And I think the role of, in this last while, the role of funding organizations, and I'm referring to Ford here, Norway before, um, in supporting the work um, leading not only to this publication but to a number of other efforts remains very important. And I think other organizations need to be uh, encouraged to follow through. 
Now, my points here have been a number of things have been happening uh, while leading to ADAS, which hopefully have had some influence in getting the commitments that were made. But we have seen commitments made before with very little action after. So going forward, I think, remains tremendously uh, important. And some of what I've just said, I think, refers to that. But uh, to me, going forward is really a new beginning uh, to ensure that commitments made are respected, um, commitments made that actions happen uh, following that. And I will identify a few uh, critical areas where work will be important, and I would like to uh, commend uh, for you to read the book, and Tom, uh, the, your last chapter, I think, is, is very good in this regard um, and very helpful, and I will have some of the points that you have made here, but a few more. I think what we all know is that if you don't have political will at the top and a readiness for action, you won't get very far. In order to get that, you also need the people to begin to understand that they don't have to live with the loss of the resources that belongs to them and that they are ready to unite, come together, and put that pressure upward, but also be able to provide constructive uh, support and, and recommendations. And in between, we have all the institutions that we heard about, whether it's customs, whether it's the judiciary, and many others, that if they don't have the strength, the capacity uh, to deal with uh, enforcement uh, and prevention and detection, uh, not a lot will happen. So I think going forward, we're talking of financial transparency and all revenues, all disbursements, um, following the money, as was said before, remains vital. Otherwise, we won't have the information, neither will the people in the countries, to hold our governments accountable. The issue of public register of beneficial owners of companies, trusts, and other financial institutions in all countries. I mean, the G20 has now taken this on, but if it doesn't become uh, a global issue where all countries participate in this, um, people will move their illicit money somewhere else where you don't have the requirement for public registers. My third point is to really advance the work on misinvoicing uh, and to really continue to engage, I think, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD are three very important international institutions uh, in this regard. Complete the unfinished work on transparency and cooperation in tax information. And again, bring in those from outside of the circle that have been working on this, because again, you need a global solution here, and you need that cooperation, and not just bilateral, but you need the multilateral work which has started uh, to happen. I will also add one thing that we haven't talked about today yet, and to me, this is the whole extractive sector. Um, and I'll start by an example. I was meeting with President Kagame a few years ago, and he said, these three mines are closing in the next two to three years. Rwanda has never received one penny in royalties, in, in, in tax, or in concession fees. I said, well, why? Because the fine print in the agreement said that any uh, net revenues here uh, could be spent where we're exploring somewhere else to the exp extent that we're exploring, and of course, you're always exploring. And, you know, that is certainly one aspect. But then, you know, the whole movement of some of the high-end uh, um, goods in, from the mining sector, uh, again, is feeding what we're talking about today. So I would say that the whole area 
of uh, natural, of, of extractive industries uh, need to be uh, not only supported, but as it, and countries, um, to some extent, I, I was asking President Kagame, why did this happen? Was it corruption? Somebody paid money under the table? Was it the lack of capacity of those who negotiated compared to who was on the other side of the table? All of the above or more? And, uh, you know, who knows? But what we know is that this is not unique to Rwanda. And a number of countries have started to renegotiate Chile, as an example, their agreements because of the money leaving the country and some of it also from extractive industry turning into illicit financial flows. So we can come back to that. Um, I think my, my other point goes to that middle group uh, that I was mentioning before, the institutions, whether it be the judiciary, the police, the customs, uh, the tax, those who are the custodians in a way of what happens when money moves in and out um, and in many countries, and I would venture to say in some of our Western countries, the sophistication of the facilitators is much better and higher than those who are responsible to make this happen. And here I'm talking of prosecutors, of judges, or of police. So much is happening. It is better in a number of countries than it was. But we're very far from being where we need to be in terms of having the capacity to prevent, to detect, and to sanction uh, illicit flows and the, the related uh, areas. I'm talking of audit. You know, when Ellen Sirleaf Johnson arrived in Liberia, um, she just arrived immediately after the whole debacle and the war, and one of the first things that she decided she would do would be to recruit a forensic auditor who was Liberian but had been living in the United States uh, as a professional for a long time and said, come back home for five years and I want you to establish a strong audit uh, responsibility in this country. And I saw what the result of what they were able to find, sanction, and then give themselves the means to prevent in the future. And that's, I'm using this as a small example. Um, we've got, a, we've talked a lot about data today. It remains so important in countries uh, around the world, in particular in developing countries. I was meeting once with the Minister of Finance of a developing country, and I was asking him um, about data, about information that he had the conversation was short. He said, I've got three economists, and I'm responsible for national, provincial, and local um, financing. Uh, so he rested his case. But, uh, you know, I think that that remains the data and the support to ensuring that information is available. We can talk about transparency, but if the information is not available, we're not getting anywhere. I would like just to make a few more comments. Uh, I think that the whole area of due diligence for the banks on knowing your clients, on ensuring that they have the preventive measures to stop illicit flows, to report it as they see it coming, and make sure that it becomes part of the justice system, to me, remains a very big part of an unfinished business here. And we haven't talked much about the recovery of stolen assets. Uh, again, this is very much an unfinished business. And I have been in countries uh, in Africa where the negotiations had been going on for decades on trying to recover assets at a great cost to that country, but with very little in result, if any. And we just have to think about Abasha, we can think of Marcos, we can think about a number of other world leaders uh, whose money for their family or themselves is still uh, out there. Um, and I would also add that we need to spend quite a bit more time on trying to see how we deal with intermediaries. And our last panel spoke about some of that. And it's not just the lawyers and the accountants. 
uh, who are the facilitators. It's the real estate agents, and it's many more. Okay, so uh, that to me is, and finally, um, I think that the the work of civil society, of leaders of industry being brought on board, of the academic sector, of the inst international institutions, uh, will remain more and more important if we want to make sure that ADIS and the SDGs are not just dreams, are not just words, commitments that don't turn into action. And to make sure, because you, you need the global uh, cooperation for this to happen. No one country alone, of course, we know can do it. And I'd like to go back um, to the fact that um, we need to engage the people of the countries as well, find better ways of doing that, provide constructive mechanisms and tools, not just identify the problems, because then we're not doing better than the, the leaders who approved in Addis their, or who put forward their major commitments. So we need to see these as a reality. If we want to go back to the first point of the dedication of this book, of dealing with the uh, fact that poverty is such an injustice, but so, and the lack of peace and the lack of security also is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Huguette. Um, we hadn't mentioned political will prior to Huguette's comments, but I think it's always important to bring that up uh, and also sort of puts things into light as, as, a challenge, as much of a challenge as it has been to get illicit flows into the ATIS agenda and the SDG agenda. Uh, we know what's ahead of us, which is trying to build that political will around, around the globe to really address, it on the, uh, address this problem on the ground. Huguette also mentioned uh, the issue of data, and that will be the topic of our next panel. Very good segue. Thank you for that. Uh, we talk about data all the time, not only within GFI, but within the broader uh, NGO community, within the FTC and elsewhere. We always try to strive to get the best, most comprehensive data possible to try to put out as accurate estimates as we possibly can. We're constantly asking, how do we improve it? How do we broaden it? And that's what our next uh, panelists will discuss. I'd like to ask Dr. Dev Carr, uh, Anders Agerskov, Tamara Razan, and Porter McConnell up front, please. Thanks very much. <laughs>